On a warm August day, a 31-year-old man went about cleaning his home, so it was absolutely spotless. He turned the heating up to the full, then he took off all of his clothes, went into his bathroom, and with the light turned off and the door closed, he then proceeded to zip and padlock himself into a large sports bag which was already in the bathtub, where he then accidentally died of suffocation. Or at least that's the official story. The true story is shrouded in a heavy veil of mystery and international espionage. But before we continue, let me tell you that today's cipher is Rotate 10. As you already know, we try to include and encode secret messages, cryptic messages within the stories that are already full of secrets and unknown. If you're up to the challenge, then look for the message and get on solving it. Don't tell us the answer, but tell us the source. Write it into the comments below and that way we're gonna know that you actually solved it and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. All the best of luck. And now let's get on with the story. Gareth Williams' story begins in Anglesey in North Wales. As a child, he was a math prodigy. And by the age of 17, he had already completed his university degree. It was his extraordinary talent, along with his online gaming prowess, that caught the eye of GCHQ, the British Intelligence Services, where he was recruited at the age of 21. And there, his skills in code breaking flourished. Gareth was a master of ciphers and soon he found his way into the world of spies, a path that would shape his destiny in ways no one could have even imagined or foreseen. But Gareth wasn't actually a spy, he was an award-winning codebreaker. At GCHQ, he was immersed in a world of complex codes and cryptographic challenges. His exceptional talent in code breaking not only defined his career, but also led to, to his secondment to MI6, a transition that marked a deepening involvement in the intricate web of international intelligence. However, beneath his professional achievements lay a man grappling with the realities of a secretive life. The culture of intelligence, often rigid and secluded, was directly contrasted with his personal aspirations and interests. MI6 had a very different culture compared to GCHQ and Gareth had requested to be transferred back to GCHQ in Cheltenham as he couldn't really stand the whole doggy dog atmosphere of London spy life. But because of his high security clearance and his in-depth knowledge of covered MI6 programs, he also had to spend time in the US liaising with the NSA as the UK and US have agreements in place for shared information. But away from the world of intelligence, Gareth was a man of diverse interests and close family ties. He loved cycling and he was often seen racing against the clock in time trials. His family ties, especially with his father, were very strong. They shared hiking and climbing trips together. Friends and family members, you know, they they knew him as a private guy, but generous individual. Someone who, despite his extraordinary intellect, remained grounded and approachable. On Sunday, August 15th, 31-year-old Gareth headed into the center of London to go shopping. He went to Harvey Nichols and Harrods, both very expensive shops, just a kilometer or so from where he actually lived, where he bought several items. Then in the afternoon, he made his way back to his apartment in Alderney Street. His apartment, which was a pre-Georgian style terraced house, was actually used by MI6 as a sort of a safe house. But as Gareth was staying in London working for them, they allowed him to stay there too. The house had an alarm that was linked directly to MI6 headquarters just a mile away. That evening, he cooked himself a nice peppered steak. And then around 11.30 p.m., he backed up all of the data from his phone onto his laptop. And then he spent a little time browsing a cycling website because, you know, it was something that he was 
actually really passionate about. The next morning on August 16th, Gareth was meant to hold a meeting at MI6, but he never actually showed up. He'd also arranged to meet a war colleague from GCHQ on the Monday evening, but again, Gareth didn't appear. Then on Friday, he missed another work meeting. Now remember, Gareth was working for MI6 at this time. Not just any ordinary company, but Britain's secret intelligence services. You'd think that they'd be quick off the mark if one of their employees was missing like this. So on a Friday, his line manager checked the work guidelines as to what to do if somebody hasn't shown up. And the procedures to follow included things like calling around the hospitals. But he didn't bother doing any of that and went home for the weekend. Gareth's sister, Siri, had been trying to call him for several days as they were planning to go to Paris together, but he hadn't answered. So she was worried and she called MI6 on Monday 23rd of August to find out if he was okay. This was not like Gareth at all. He always kept in touch with his family. They were very close, remember? And he always showed up to work on time, every single day, regular like clockwork. So MI6 called the local police, asked them to drop into Garrett's flat to do what's called a wellness check. A police officer, PC Gallagher, got the key from the housing manager and told them to stay downstairs while he and his colleague went upstairs to check on the, on the apartment. As the officers entered, they noticed that the heating was on full blast, despite it being summer and a fairly warm time outside, at least warm for the UK. He noticed that the apartment was fairly neat and tidy. A laptop and a phone were laid out on the floor of the living room. There was another mobile phone on the dining table with two SIM cards next to it. There was a pink long-haired wig and a woman's dress on a dining chair. There were no dirty dishes in the kitchen, but there was a green cloth on the floor. As they walked into the main bedroom, they saw the duvet and dressing gown on the floor. Then the last room to be checked was the ensuite bathroom, a windowless room just off the bedroom. PC Gallagher opened the door to find it completely enshrouded in darkness. He switched on the light and saw there in the bathtub a large bulging red sports bag. He tried to pick it up, but he could tell from the foul smelling red liquid that was already seeping from the back that there was some, something like a body inside. And that body turned out to be Gareth Williams. After Gareth was found, the Metropolitan Police, the London Police, launched a full-scale investigation, navigating the delicate intersection between a potential crime scene and matters of national security. The discovery of his body in a locked sports bag raised immediate red flags. Forensic teams scoured the scene for evidence. They found trace amounts of DNA on a zip fastener, the bag handle and the green towel. Plus, they found two small hairs on Gareth's thumb, but they couldn't identify any of it. And there were none of Gareth's fingerprints or footprints on a bath. There was also no sign that Gareth had put up any kind of fight. In fact, he appeared almost serene and calm with his hands neatly folded across his chest. If somebody had forced him into, into the bag, if he had realized that he was running out of air, he would have panicked and that would have been quite evident from his face and the body. Added to that, the key to the padlock was actually inside the bag underneath his body. However, Gareth Seaman was found on a bathroom floor. Although this probably wasn't that unusual for a single guy living alone, if you know what I mean. But there was semen from an unknown individual found on the green cloth on the floor of the kitchen. There was also DNA and fingerprints all over the apartment from around 20 different people, none of whom could be identified. The phone in the living room had been wiped the night before. No reason could have been given for this. Maybe he had backed up his phone to his laptop and then 
wipe the phone. Maybe this was standard procedure because of his MI6 work. But the police couldn't find out because MI6 was actively withholding any information they had. It was discovered that he had had several MI6 pen drives in his locker at work, but they were all wiped before the police even found out what was on them. Obviously, MI6 would have wiped them themselves. The police didn't have the security clearance to have access to any of the sensitive information. The police also wouldn't or maybe couldn't confirm or deny that Garrett's personal computer was missing. However, the sordid details of his internet browsing history, that was revealed. He had accessed bondage websites several times, but one thing most of the media neglected to say was that it was only four times over a two-year period. That's more like accidental porn browsing. Someone who would be into stuffing themselves into a bag for kicks would truly have been looking at that kind of thing quite a bit more often than just four times in two years. Then there was the women's clothing. 15,000 pounds worth of designer women's gear was found in the apartment, but none of it had been worn. Most would have fitted Gareth, and it was all still packed into the packaging that, that it was bought in. His sister Siri and his friend C.N. Lloyd-Jones insisted that he was a generous person who had probably bought the clothes for them. And to be honest, 15,000 sounds like a lot, but this was designer gear. A Balenciaga bag alone cost £2,000, so it probably wouldn't have actually amounted to many items. He was hardly hoarding women's clothing, as some newspapers actually suggested. He had also enrolled in a fashion design course, which was one of his shared interests with CM. So maybe that explained the clothes too. However, besides these sort of facts, determining the cause of death was proving to be challenging. Because the flat heating had been turned up to max, the decomposition of Garrett's body had accelerated, making the job of the forensics team even harder. The autopsy results were inconclusive, there were no apparent injuries, and toxicology tests didn't reveal any substances that could have contributed to his death. Three post-mortems were carried out by different pathologists, yet none of them found the cause of death. Several theories emerged during the investigation. These ranged from accidental death, possibly related to a sex game gone wrong, to theories of a professional hit, given Williams's line of work. The police considered the possibility of Williams locking himself in the bag, a theory that was later contested by experts. Two experts tried and failed more than 300 times to lock themselves inside a similar bag. And although they did eventually get in the bag, they couldn't lock the padlock. And they definitely couldn't do it without leaving some kind of trace or handprints and fingerprints or footprints on a bath. Then his old landlady came forward to say that she had been woken one night by the sounds of Gareth screaming for help. He had tied himself to his bedpost and couldn't get free. She said that he had insisted that it wasn't sexual in nature and that he was simply just trying to see if he could free himself. Intelligence agents are routinely instructed on how to escape if they are restrained but of course, this added to the idea that maybe, just maybe, Gareth had done this to himself. But despite all of the police's hard work, the investigation still couldn't definitely conclude how or why Gareth died. The coroner's inquest ended with an open verdict, acknowledging that the circumstances of his death were suspicious. He was probably killed unlawfully, with asphyxiation or poisoning being the most likely scenario. And because of the lack of evidence in or around the bath, they concluded that a third party must have moved the bag. So who killed him? The case attracted intense media scrutiny and public interests. 
as you would expect, which was further complicated by sensational nature of some reports and theories. The police were criticized for their handling of the investigation and for releasing certain personal details about William's life. But they insisted that they weren't the source of the leaks. But someone, someone was leaking information to the press, and most of it were lies. He'd visited bondage websites, gone to gay bars and bought tickets to drag shows. Police have revealed new details about the intensely private life of MI6 spy Gareth Williams, who was found dead in his London flat in August. The media reports ranged from Gareth being a crossdresser to him using male prostitutes. They said that cocaine and gay porn was found in his home, but they were all lies. The police denied that there was any kind of evidence for these sort of made-up stories. And the inquest found that the leaks were an attempt to manipulate the evidence. But where were these leaks coming from? Who wanted to brand Gareth as a deviant and why? There are many unanswered questions surrounding this case. And I think that was probably the point. If a death is seen as being really embarrassing for the victim or the family, then maybe they'll push less for an investigation. If a death is beyond weird, then all sorts of theories are put forward and they can muddy the waters. We have to ask why didn't MI6 report Garrett's absence for seven days? Did somebody within MI6 kill Garrett? Many intelligence analysts and even MI6 agents have said that if an agent doesn't show up for work, then protocols are enacted within four hours. The coroner said that MI6's account of the delay began to stretch bounds of credibility. Was this the line manager that was just being incompetent or did MI6 find out he was dead and then they cleaned up the mess left by the killer? But why would they cover it up? Or did they kill him themselves? Did Gareth find something out in the course of his work that could have gotten him killed? Now you'd think that these kinds of deaths are rare, but not so much in a secret service, apparently. There has been a bit of a trend for people linked to British intelligence offing themselves while carrying out their solo sex games. In 1993, 25-year-old Stephen Drinkwater, who worked as a clerk at GCHQ, was found dead in his home with a plastic bag over his head. In 1990, Jonathan Moyle, a journalist and secret MI6 agent, allegedly on the brink of exposing arms dealings with Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, was found hanging inside a wardrobe in Chile with a plastic nappy on and a pillowcase on his head. In 1994, Stephen Milligan, a conservative politician, was found dead tied to a chair, naked apart from suspenders and stockings, with a cord around his neck, a piece of orange in his mouth and a plastic bag over his head. Those pesky plastic bags. And a few months later, James Rusbridger, an ex-MI6 turned journalist, was found hanged at his house in Cornwall, in a green hazmat suit, including rubber gloves, gas mask, and black plastic Macintosh, surrounded by bondage photos. In 1997, another GCHQ worker, Nicholas' husband, 46 years old, was found dead at home, dressed in a bra and panties, you guessed it, with a plastic bag over his head. In 1999, Kevin Allen, 31 years old, a language expert at GCHQ, was found dead in his bed at home, once again with a plastic bag over his head and a dust mask over his mouth. These deaths have all been linked to the UK Secret Service in some way, apart from plastic bags. Did they all die accidentally while performing, performing some kind of kinky solo sex games or were they killed for whatever they knew. G 
GCHQ works very closely with MI6 and is responsible for gathering intelligence from communications, monitoring and passing that information on to be actioned. Now, Gareth was said to have had a fairly high level of clearance and that possibly meant that he knew all about certain listening and monitoring programs that the British spy agency ran at the time. Programs like, for instance, the Tempora. The world's major telecommunication firms have been working alongside a British intelligence agency, handing over swathes of private data. Britain's eavesdropping centre, GCHQ, is running the biggest operation. You have nothing to fear, uh, nothing to fear about the British state or intelligence agencies listening to your f the contents of your phone calls. <laughs> Program run by GCHQ for the British government. It's Big Brother Internet style. It taps into fiber optic internet cables and has the capability to listen in on telephone calls, read emails, monitor social media, private messaging, and browser history. And it does not discriminate between suspects and ordinary people, like you and me. It collects data on everyone. It launched in 2011, the year after Gareth died, although it was on a top secret trial run from 2008 until 2011. GCHQ works very closely with the NSA and the US government, even invests millions into the systems that they also have access to when it comes to data collection. And as we know, Gareth had been going to the US several times a year to liaise with the NSA. Was his death something to do with his work on the Tempora program? Gareth had conducted several unauthorized searches of the MI6 database. Was he looking into things that he shouldn't have, perhaps? Or could it have been the Russians? At the time Gareth died, London was becoming a bit of a hotspot for Russian oligarchs who needed to move their billions of dollars out of Russia and into a more easily accessible area. The Panama Papers were leaked in 2016, and that showed just how much money was being laundered through London at the time. The house Gareth lived in was found to be owned by a company called New Rodina Limited, which according to the Panama Papers is registered in the British Virgin Islands. Rodina incidentally means family in Russian and also in Romanian, Slovak, Czech and maybe a bunch of other Slavic languages. The company tries to hide behind a trust called Verite Trust Limited, based in Jersey, the UK offshore tax haven that is used by politicians and oligarchs alike. This theory was fueled by the broader context of Williams's work in intelligence, particularly given the heightened tensions between the UK and Russia and past incidents of Russian state-sponsored actions that actually occurred on British soil. Then a theory was proposed by a former KGB defector, Major Boris Karpichko, suggesting a sinister plot. Gareth had allegedly unmasked a Russian mole within GCHQ. He proposed that this marked Gareth as a target for Russian operatives. This potentially connects his death to Russian intelligence activities. Karpichko alleged that he had seen numerous cars with Russian number plates near Gareth's apartment from June to July 2010, but then they mysteriously disappeared by August. He happened to live not far from Gareth and he was apparently fearing for his life at the time. Having defected 12 years earlier, he's still fearing for his life now apparently, some 27 years since defecting. But this is just one man's theory based on hearsay and supposition. Maybe it's true, but who knows? What we do know is that we're left with an enigma, a story with more questions than answers. The life and death of Gareth Williams remains shrouded in mystery, a puzzle that is still unsolved. His family and friends continue to grapple with the unknown, having had their loved one unfairly slandered by unknown sources and judged by cruel media to be a deviant. In the world of espionage, where secrets are currency, the truth about Williams may 
just forever lie beyond our reach, never to be found. <laughs>